Hello, everybody. Josh Neighbors here, Locked On Nationals podcast. Joining us, our friend from NBC Sports Washington it is Matt Wyrick. Nat Spring Training, it's begun. You probably haven't watched it because Masson doesn't televise much of it, but we'll tell you our early thoughts from that. Also, some Nationals arbitration news and more coming up on tonight's show. You are Locked On Nationals, your daily Washington Nationals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Matt, I, I saw you sneaking a sip of something, and that reminded me I had to also. What are you What are you drinking tonight as we do our show? The Matt Wired staple, Dr. Pepper, always. I, I've got bubbly, uh, the sparkling water. I feel like that reminded me. I, I just always take drinks of water at the most inopportune times, and also it costs me because I drink carbonated stuff. So the folks might be like, Josh's mm-hmm. hiccup? The answer is probably yes. Uh, you heard that, but it just reminded me seeing you do that. I'm like, damn, I always drink at the most inopportune times for the show. All right. So you and I were talking, and once again, Matt Wyrick, NBC Sports Washington, you and I were talking before we started uh, about some news. I just came across the wire about arbitration for two Nationals players. So let us know. Let us Let us have it. Yeah, so according to multiple reports, the Nationals have avoided arbitration with Juan Soto. Uh, it's $17.2 million. Uh, that exceeds his MLB trade rumors uh, projection of $16.2 million, so certainly getting his worth there. Uh, and Josh Bell also agreed to a $10 million salary for this year. So both Scott Boris clients, the news broke within like five minutes of each other, so they must have just kind of knocked him out bang, bang. And I, I so I saw John Heyman's tweet, and uh, it, it was very misleading. Juan Soto, yeah. comma, Nats have a deal. Um, I would say, like, for Josh Bell, you could say that. For one, I, I think that's I, I think John knows what he's doing here. <laughs> yeah, he's trolling. It has got to be. Yeah. I, I, you know what? I really wish that the that MLB reporters like did not do stuff like that. Like, you've got John Heyman on here trolling. You've got Jeff Passan, who is always like making comments about people's mothers on Twitter, which I find to be funny yet also unprofessional. Like, where is where is Shams or Woj? Why can't we just get a Shams or Woj just like straight up professional? I tweets? mean, Woj Woj like emailed some congressman Josh saying Hawley. "f you." So. Yeah. Now, so, now, I mean. now that one was that one was dumb. That was not a good look for my guy Woj. So that is fair, but like at least on on Twitter, he's all business. Like he he's yeah. all. He's all business, but let's get to this. So you and I were talking also about some of the biggest deals. I I don't know exactly where Soto's falls, but 17.2, I believe was the number that you said. Um, Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, an arbitration, man, that's a big number. Now it's look, once again, it's nice that he's under arbitration because he's so young, but like that is a big, and they avoid arbitration by doing this. It's a big number though. It's a big number. He's going to be paid. I mean, I just saw Vladdy. I think he's in his first year of arbitration. He's getting seven point nine million. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> Soto is getting paid for sure. Uh, it's it's definitely something that you have to kind of take into account now if you're uh, you know going to extend him right now. Uh, is he going to get a raise on top of that seventeen million in your uh, extension, or will it be tacked on to the end of it? What exactly is the deal there? Who knows? But we know for sure he'll be playing for seventeen point two million. So uh, that, at the very least, is what he'll be making next season or this season. And then, and then the conversation around Josh Bell is an interesting one, right? Because you know, you and I kicked this around too. Like that's somebody that I feel like the Nationals should maybe just go ahead and give an extension to, but they, I think Scott Boris was like, no. And, and once again, it's kind of his MO, right? You, you guys hit free agency. Um, that's somebody I'd like to see them get a deal done with just because, you know, we, we've mentioned this a bunch, but there is a certain amount of, um, you know, clarity, I guess you could say, uh, and value to just saying, look, first base is taken care of for us for the next few years, or maybe even, you know, some, some DHing as well, depending on what happens. Um, but, this, this, you know, obviously Nelson Cruz is there, but, you know, things can change pretty fast. But, yeah, I think Josh Bell, what is he, 29, about to be 30? Um, I, I think there's some value to saying, look, this guy's a power-hitting first baseman. Like, there's no really harm done 
locking up Josh Bell until he's 33. I know he's going through some some dips and some peaks and valleys, basically. But he had a really good year last year. I mean, he really recovered off that really off that really bad start. And I think that's a player that is a strong veteran strong veteran building block for a team that doesn't have too many of those. So I, I think um, now there should be a conversation what they can do to keep him in D.C. Do you agree? Yeah, you know, I would say that it's something that could work out for both sides, uh, you know, getting that lo- that long term security for Bell. Uh, the Nationals don't really have first base depth. I mean, after him, the really only notable player in the Nationals farm system who plays first base is Jake Knoll. And Knoll right. had a good season last year, was actually their minor league player of the year, kind of raked in triple A. But, you know, he's not really considered a top prospect or anything. He's pretty old for a prospect as well. So you can attribute that to his, his why he was able to hit so well last year. Um, so, you know, can he do it at the major league level? Are you gonna really going to invest in him as a first baseman? Probably not when you usually depend on first base for so much offensive production. Uh, you know, Bell, I thought he was a really good player, really good hitter uh, for them after his early struggles last year. You know, 850 OPS after May 15th, that's really good. I mean, that's that's almost all-star caliber uh, for, for at first base. And, you know, you got if you sign him to a long-term deal, you can at least show Soto, hey, this is one guy that you know will be hitting somewhere behind you in the lineup for the next however many years, sign an extension with us. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think he's such an interesting player to me just because like he's so I mean, the book, the book club thing. I know it's a weird thing to point out, but like it kind of tells you all you need to know about him. Right. And for a team that just lost Mr. National to have somebody who actually plays that position also like as a community person just is like such a likable dude. Right. And I mean, you've got to interact with them some too, in the media stuff like there's not many people who are like, F that guy. That guy sucks, right? You just don't get that yeah. with Josh Bell. No. I mean, uh, people were definitely – the narrative around him early on last season was that he couldn't re- recover from his 2019 form, had a poor 2020, and then the, the bad start in 2021. That kind of you know, set the conversation for him for the year, and I think a lot of people kind of looked at the numbers at the end of the year and were like, wow, Josh Bell really actually turned out to be not so bad. Um, and, you know, he's a, a guy with a, a fun, bit of a funky swing. It's got a lot going on, uh, and it's all about his timing. Uh, so, you know, when he's going cold, it's going to be cold. But when he's hot, right. you know, we've, we've seen him hit some tanks. All right, quick word from our sponsors here. Then we'll talk about some spring training news and notes. Today's show is brought to you by Mission Possible. Are you guys ready to discover your purpose and leave an impact wherever you go? Mission Possible, written and uh, read by the New York Times bestselling author, An athlete, Tim Tebow, former Met, encourages you to find your inspiration, pursue your purpose, and create a life for yourself that counts. Ignite a new spark in your life through this new inspirational listen. Mission Possible by Tim Tebow is available wherever audiobooks are sold. All right, Matt. So we've seen, well, we have not seen more than one game. Um, Once again, one of the greatest, greatest rivalries in baseball is Nationals versus their RSN, right? I mean... What's better than a Nationals versus Masson feud? It's, this has been going on for a while now. But, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here. Like, aren't other teams, a majority of their spring training games, on their, on their RSNs? Uh, I would say, yeah, especially the ones that own a part of their RSNs. Right, uh, yes. Usually we'll get them down there. Um, it's just a little, it's easier for them to do it. Uh, it's more content Nationals too, right? Having, what do they have like a 25% stake? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's more promotion of your team, all that kind of stuff. But ultimately this was a mass decision, not a nationals decision as I understand right. it. Oh, yeah. uh, and you know, the Orioles are kind of getting the same treatment um, even though they have, you know, a much more majority stake in the, in the organization. Yeah. And also it's, it's very interesting because now it's the time where you want to see these guys. I mean, this is like these spring trainings are, you know, I know they're not that important, but Look, there's a lot of sorting for the Nationals to do, right? And a lot of fans want to see see these guys. And, you know, you, you and I have had to listen to some of the radio broadcasts. And they had one game on, but it was on a Monday night, right? So kind of just weirdly shoehorned in there. So, you know, if you weren't able to watch it, it's kind of like one of your opportunities going by. I was able to catch just a little bit of it. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it's – you know, another interesting part of this, too, is a lot of teams are having their – uh, television broadcast crews travel again. And I, look, a lot of those guys, I know it's a grueling season, but a lot of those guys want to get out on the road. And look, you, you've been in press boxes. I've been in a lot of press boxes as well, too. There is just a, um, you you do get a better feel 
if you are in person. It's in a the better product months. for the fans. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Talking to, and I guarantee you those conversations, you know, we don't know this stuff. We, you know, a lot of fans don't know this stuff, but the conversations that guys like, uh, you know, Bob Carpenter have with a Gary Cohen, right. Or, 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 you know, uh, Gary Keith or, you know, any of those guys, like you get little insights from talking to those guys that you might not have gotten before, you know, uh, an FP Santangelo or now this year, Kevin Franson talks to a, another player who's doing broadcast for those other guys. That's valuable stuff that, that, that translates on broadcast. You know, you always hear guys say, Hey, we got to catch up with so-and-so love those guys. They were telling us about player X, Y, or Z. You hear it all the time. You know, I think about it, but watch and listen. You'll hear a lot of that this year because those guys, I can guarantee you, are so happy to be, be back together. The sad part is, at least for the start of the season, Nats broadcast team not getting that. So I, I would argue, too, like that's actually going to hurt the broadcast. Once again, I like Franzen. I like Carp, too. They'll do fine. But like there are extra stuff that you just don't get if you're not in the press box. You're not in person. You don't get a feel for the crowd. Uh, the sideline reporter is always, uh, you know, at least in my experience, it, you know, in the locker room before and after games at the press conferences with the with the manager. He's not able to do that or she's not able to do that. If, if you know, Dan Coco in this instance is not going to road games, you know, you're not going to get a whole bunch mm-hmm. of insight, you know, during games from his reports that you would normally get. So, you know, there's it's it's a money saving move. It's unfortunate that the fan and, you know, the product has to suffer as a result. Uh, but uh, I felt like, you know, as soon as the pandemic shut things down and, and people, you know, s- outlets started doing this, that it was going to be a long road to get back to it, if at all. Uh, I'm just glad that, you know, MLB is, is letting people back in the clubhouse again this year. That's that was something I was worried about uh, not being able to go into the clubhouses anymore. Um, it seems like that, that that's been something that uh, the BBWAA has really pushed for. So mm-hmm. you know, very grateful for their efforts uh, to make sure that happens because. You really can't replicate it, you know. Uh, as somebody who has been a strict remote reporter for the last two years, covering the team through Zoom, I mean, there it, it's just irreplaceable, and you you don't get that day to day interactions and the, the little insights that you would get just from passing a guy in the hallway, uh, as opposed to sitting down in a press conference on a Zoom call with twelve other reporters getting two questions in, uh, you know, over choppy video. It's just not it's not the same. That, that relationship building, I mean, you just can't replace it. I know we sound like two just media dudes complaining, but like th- there's a reason why us media people cover the team. There's a reason why you guys you know, want to listen. You guys want the insights from the players, right? You guys want to hear the, the reason why we bring Matt on, you know, the, the, kind of Matt's here. Yes, obviously. But like, Matt, you come on because you have a very good insight and, and you're somebody that clearly is seeking out these stories. Like that's what media do. They're, the job is to be the conduit from the fan to the player, right? We're not just doing it to blow our own, you know, blow smoke up our own, you know, you know what's like the whole point yeah. of this is to get the stories out to the fans. I think that gets lost sometimes. And I think you're totally right. I- I'm so glad, but um, you know, look, the, the nationals, it's not their fault uh, that this stuff's not being covered as, as it should. I think it's pretty fair to say that, you know, Masson is making some cost cutting moves, but that it's not going to help the product. I think and generally speaking. Yeah. I mean, the Nationals made two huge announcements in the middle of the game last night on the broadcast. Had to wait till the third game of spring on a Monday night to do it. Yeah, they did it. Let's see. First announcement was Zimmerman retired, and the second one was? Was the uh, alternate jerseys that are coming this year, which um, I saw the hint might about. be Cherry Blossom uh, theme, which fans have been calling for for so long. It's <laughs> actually DC United fans have really been pushing for it, and it seems like the Nats might beat them to the punch. Uh, so. The, the Nats tweeted out a couple of like color scale things and a uh, right. picture of like cherry blossoms mean more to us this year or something like that a couple of days prior. So it seems like that's what it's going to be, which I'm very excited. It's, it's going to be the rose pink and silver were the two colors that they highlighted. So I wonder if it's like going to be silver trim on pink letters with like a letter pink background too. or do you go silver jersey with pink lettering. I don't know. I don't know. if I would not go with the pink. Because I think they do the pink on – they do it during Mother's Day normally, right? That There's that pink mm-hmm. theme they do for yeah. breast cancer, whatever. I would probably not – just to make sure there's no confusion, right? I would go with the silver unis with that – that, and I know it's the pinks are completely different shades, right? I, I would mm-hmm. go I would go with like what you said, the silver jersey with the pink letters. What do you, is, is, that, is that what you want to say? What are you thinking? My only thing is I don't want it to look like a road jersey, you know? Mm, so okay, you, yeah, you yeah, got to yeah. have it. 
it can't look gray. If you're going to go silver, it's got to look silver. And if you're not trying to nail that look over an entire jersey as opposed to just lettering, might be a little Definitely. harder. But apparently, Lerner, Mark Lerner said on the broadcast that they've been in talks with Nike over these jerseys for a few years. So they've been like, you know, perfecting this uh, over time. So I, I'm feeling optimistic about it. I think the Nationals have really, honestly, I've always liked the Nationals jerseys. I think that. Mm -hmm. uh, over the years, anything but the uh, basic block nationals across the the chest that they had for a few years, anything other than that has been really good. The curly. I'll be w, honest, I don't love the, the hats though with the capital on. I, I'm not a fan of those hats. I love the W. I love the Walgreens yeah, they W. Just have the w. Feed me yeah. the Walgreens W all day long. I, I love or the Senators hat. W. The Senators W. Yeah, yes. I think it's very yes. retro looking. It's yeah. like it fits baseball. I mean, baseball yeah. is retro looking in general. I mean, the guys are out there wearing giant pajamas for God's sakes. I mean, yeah, you know, right. <laughs> yeah, that's a fair point. That's a very fair point. Uh, all right. So one more quick word from our sponsors. I guarantee you guys will actually talk about some Nationals baseball related stuff. But these stories are all coming out now. It's it's, it's worth mentioning because uh, once again, we can't watch a whole lot of the baseball. Today's show is brought to you guys by rockauto.com with the ever increasing numbers of makes and models for cars. It's now impossible to go to your local chain or auto parts store and find all the parts that you need. And also, why would you ch choose to spend 30, 50, or even 100% more of the same parts from a chain store or a car dealership? For example, a Honda Odyssey fuel pump is 353 from a chain store, 216 at rockauto.com. So go to rockauto.com today. And when you guys do, use the promo code locked on. That's L O C K E D O N. Make sure that they know that you or we sent you their amazing selection. Always low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. That's rockauto.com today. All right, so uh, Matt, tell me what you've observed. Let's let's do that first. Anything that you've observed through the one game we saw on TV and some of the highlights from elsewhere, and also that you've listened to that has been most intriguing to you so far, and then part two we'll do what you're looking forward next, but let's just handle the observations so far through three games. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've listened to all the games that weren't broadcast on the radio, so I have mm -hmm. at least heard Charlie and Dave's take on everything. Um, I guess uh, one of the big things that stood out to me uh, is Sean Doolittle's Velo's back. He was throwing 93 94 uh, in the game yesterday, which is a very good sign. Uh, took a big dip in 2020. He showed, uh, got a little bit, bit of it back last year, but seems to at least be throwing about what he was averaging pre 2019, you know, th those days. So, that is a good sign uh, as pretty much the only left-hander projected to make the Nationals bullpen right now. That, you know, Sam Clay and Luis Avilon are the only ones who else are you know, in contention. So uh, that is pretty significant. Uh, you figure he's going to play a big role. Um, Josiah Gray gave up three home runs in his first inning of work. Yeah. Uh, not, not a great first impression, especially considering that he gave up a lot of home runs last year. But uh, he came back out for the second inning uh, and, and did all right. Uh, you know, he's he's trying to add more changeups this year. He did not give up the home runs on changeups. Uh, I believe they were uh, on uh, sliders, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So the, the slider clearly needs work. And he was just leaving pitches over the middle of the plate. Uh, but that's something that, you know, you're going to have to kind of keep an eye on is how, how those home runs come along for him uh, as spring training goes on. And um, other options. Hey, Kamali, nice little, nice little. Nice little stretch, right, for Kate Cavalli? Kate, looking, looking pretty good. Kate looked great. Yeah, lots of strikeouts, which is a great sign. I mean, he, he yes. led the minor leagues in strikeouts last year. I will say Kate came into this uh, appearance very strong. Uh, he has been in minor league camp already. Um, right. He was able to attend uh, what before while the lockout was still going on. So he has been in camp for a while facing – uh, opposing hitters, things like that, as opposed to some of these guys who are just getting. It's also why up. you saw him go three innings as well, too. I mean, it was a bit longer of a leash. Yeah, you know the, the, exactly. Yeah. And you know, same with Anibal Sanchez. He's you know he's not been in camp, but he's been ramped up for a little while. Um, so that's why he was able, also able to go three innings. He came into camp strong, um, which I think bodes well for his chances of making the rotation uh, out of spring, especially with Joe Ross and Steven Strasburg expected to be on the injured list to begin the year. So I would think that uh, if, if Anibal comes out and has another strong start like he did, uh, I would expect him to be that fourth guy at least with that fifth spot still kind of wide open. I'd say Eric Fetty's probably the guy. He's right. two, two solid innings, but, uh, you know, Fetty's running out of chances. I think that he probably right. wouldn't get that fifth spot, and they roll with those five guys, Strasburg, Corbin, Gray, uh, Fetty, and Anibal. 
Um, and then when Ross or Strasburg, well, probably Strasburg first comes back, um, you know, it's either going to be Sanchez or Fetty on the chopping block. And, you know, who knows? You got it. Uh, I mean, can they really do the Anibal Sanchez? I know everybody's like, looks great. But like, can we seriously do that again? I mean, I mean, he's they, he's a known commodity. I, mean, I was asked about this with Doolittle too. Like, can we okay. really expect him to do anything at this point? Right. Like, but but it's different. Okay. But I think it's a little bit different for starters and relievers, right? Because like John Lester last year, it the numbers were not horrible. The problem was they'd have to pull him out before they got horrible. Like they were trending in one direction, and it's like we have to get him out of the game because this is not going to go well. You know, if he stays in for pitches, you know. 70 through 90. We can't let leave him out there. That's my concern with Anibal Sanchez. Now it sounds like the stuff for him is a little bit better than what it than what John Lester was bringing to the table last year at this point in time. So I well, think I mean, that- Anibal's got like 15 pitches in his arsenal. Right. So like right. I mean hitters at this point with no timing, seeing just that wide variety of pitches, I imagine <laughs> can be very flustering for your first couple of spring training at that. So I just think um, that for me, it's like know, that 2020 it went, went so poorly for him that it's like, you know, maybe, you could, maybe you could just write it off, right? Maybe you could write it off, but dear God, that was, that was out of control. And he's also, but he's coming off a year where he didn't pitch. So right. he says he's stronger now and, and more, you know, durable, able to get through the whole year. So we'll see, you know, yeah. uh, you know, he has got, he's got to make the rotation. Certainly not a, a lock at this point, but uh, his first appearance was certainly encouraging, but I would I would caution anyone out there to not read into early spring training results either right. way. You know, everyone's already saying Kate Cavalli should be in the rotation because of his first <laughs> appearance, but I, I think it's almost guaranteed he ends up in AAA to start the year. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the big question surrounding him is when do we see him? And and look, none of us who are covering this team are like, is it May? No, it's the answer is not unless everybody's arm falls off, which you know. Could happen. Not another possibility. Could happen. Bell, 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 yeah, Bell could <laughs> happen last roster. year. Yeah, you know this roster last year. I mean, why do you think Josh Rogers ended up here, fellas? Like that, that's you know that, that's that's kind of how it ran. And hey, don't, um, don't don't discount him in that conversation. I'm, I'm not dis- I'm not going to discount him. I'm just saying, like, why do you, why do we think he ended up here? Right? Why do we think Paulo Espino was at, Paulo Espino was getting wins and saves last year? Right? Because because they had they had nobody left. They had nobody left to pitch. And I'm wondering, you know. You're so right. We can't glean too much from this, but is that where our eyes should go? Do you, do you think, you know, looking at spring training, like is the pitching battle most important or do you think we should, we should pay more attention to, to which veteran bats are going to be here? Cause I think that's another thing I'm look, kind of looking at. I think the, I mean, yeah, the back end of the bullpen, I mean, sorry, the back end of the rotation is, is definitely something to watch here. Uh, the, the rotate, the, sorry, I keep mixing up bullpen. The closer yeah. role is not locked down. I think it could be either Steve Ciszek, or Will Harris at this point, I would imagine, are the two favorites uh, for that. So uh, to see how they do, uh, you know, Will Harris is supposed to make $8 million this year. So the money says that he should be the closer. But coming off a of TOS surgery, who knows, you know, how well, how good he's going to be feeling. So I think that's something to keep an eye on. And then the two on the hitting side, the, the two areas to watch are one third base, which, man, if, if any position is wide open right now, it's third base. Uh, you know, Mike Alfranco is now the leader to be the Nationals third baseman on opening day. But right. I think that, you know, because he was competing with Carter Keboom, who now has a mass flexor strain in his elbow. How, his what's the timetable on that, Matt? What, what what are we hearing on that? Four to six weeks. So, and that's four to six weeks of him, like, before he starts to, like, ramp up. Oh, that's uh, horrible. So, well, this was, yeah. this was something that I thought, you know – I like the fact they brought they brought Franco in, right? I, I like that because Carter is a guy who you mentioned Eric Fetty. I know the, the age discrepancy is a lot different, but like Carter is a guy because of where the Nationals valued him at, right? Where they where they got him. That you know, it's kind of I know he's what 23, 24? How old is he now? I think. But Might like it, it, it feels like we're at a point now with him where it's like, look, you, you gotta show us something, right? And and I think I feel bad for him. Because he can't give it an honest shot. Now, I, I will say the one difficult thing for him is that trying to become a player, you know, uh, trying to trying to come of age right now as an MLB player is very difficult, right? You and I talked about the number of off seasons consecutively that are now abnormal, right? We, we're now mm-hmm. at a point where um, the last four or five years, I was counting it, whatever it is, if you even count 2023 next season, like it's going to be a stretch of five 
It's five seasons or we're doing something different each year. So I do feel for him a little bit on that front. But, I mean, when you bring in Michael Franco, you know, that's that's not like we're bringing in, uh, you know. Estrubal Cabrera or Starling Castro. I mean, well, that's that was that's my takeaway is that. 2020 was bad. I, they given him. Right. And, and that, yes, you're, you're totally right. This is not a guy who is currently a major league player. Was, this is not somebody who's been, you know, who's been successful as of late. And so it was a, it was competition, but it was more of a slight nudge, right? Mm-hmm. Now, like you mentioned, like Michael Franco is the guy, like he is on track right now to be your opening day third baseman. I, I don't hate it, but like, I mean, you know, if he hits, if he, if he plays well, I mean, Carter's not going to get that shot. And look, I, I once again, I think 2020 was mishandled. You mentioned this Rubel. I did not think they handled that well. They said it was Carter Keeble's spot, and then it ended up being a Struble's spot. And there's been some bouncing back and forth ever since. I do really do. F- I feel for Carter though, because this is this is difficult. And but look, you're big. You're big leaguer. I mean, this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to deal with difficult situations like this. You know what I mean? I think there's yeah. two sides of this coin. It, it's it sucks because he like we really haven't got to see him aside from the last I don't want to say six weeks maybe of last season. Uh, we really haven't gotten to see Carter settle in and, you know, make adjustments. You know, his playing time has just been sp- so sporadic over the last few years where he's just kind of up and down, you know, in and out of the lineup and, and not just a regular getting the chance to to have go through a routine, get settled in and all that kind of stuff and, and adjust to major league pitching. Uh, and part of that's been due to injury and, and part of that has been due to ineffectiveness. So uh, this was supposed to be kind of the make or break year for him. Uh, if, he, if he doesn't show signs of life this season, you know, the Nationals would probably be forced to move on. Um, but now with this injury, you know, it, it's going to take some time and, and they're going to have to have some kind of stopgap situation. Here on Dranza, I think so. They only said mm-hmm. Davey only said that it was going to be Franco and Keyboom competing for third. But I think that was just to push Keyboom. They really wanted Keyboom to win the spot. And I think now with Keyboom hurt, uh, they might open it up to a Harry Adrianza, maybe even Luis Garcia or Lucius Fox, uh, if they are unbelievable. Are by the way, there's kind of Lucius Fox. I, was, um, I still think it's I unbelievable. I know, and he's awesome. Team. He's awesome. He uh, MLB Pipeline released its uh, player grades for like the whole Nationals farm system, and they've listed who scores the top uh, on each tool. And on the running tool, Lucius Fox is number one in the Nationals farm system with a 70 on the 2080 scale. Mm, he's got geez. some crazy good speed. Yeah. So if he can hit, uh, I think he would be a really fun player that a lot of Nats fans would fall in love with immediately. So you're saying that if in the extra inning uh, that the last out was Nelson Cruz, uh, that you good old Lucius Fox, Fox. Lucius Fox is going to be the guy. Uh, I love it. I, I absolutely him, love that. him or Andrew Stevenson, because Stevenson's so underrated for his speed. The, the one thing I think we all, I think all Nats fans just want to make sure they see is like, they don't want to see too many vets blocking these young guys. Because as interesting as this team is now with pieces like Azrianza and Hernandez and Nelson Cruz, like I really don't think offense is going to be the problem. Once again, it's going to be pitching again. But I just don't want to see young guys blocked by guys that are known, as you mentioned, known commodities, known quantities. Do you, is that the sentiment you're getting from fans as well? Definitely from fans. Uh, I mean, some fans really want them to push their chips into this season, which I really just don't see happening. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you know, I, I've been asked a bunch of times, like, are they, do they still have any moves left between now and opening day? And if I were, I mean, I am a betting man, not going to lie, but if I were to place a bet <laughs> on the Nationals, which I don't, I don't ever bet on the Nationals. Um, but if I were to place a bet, I would say that they don't make any moves between now and opening day, you know, maybe a salary dump type thing, but. Um, I, I don't expect them to get Conforto or anything like that. Right. Um, so, you know, is, is, I mean, the real thing is like, who would be blocking somebody like is Alcides Escobar blocking Luis Garcia? Yes. But the Nationals also see Luis Garcia as a 21 year old kid. I mean, they see him right. as making mental mistakes in the field and somebody who isn't quite ready to be an everyday player in the major leagues. So do you think he's really better off in triple A then? Him. Do you think he'd be better off triple A? Probably. I mean, they want him to shore up his defense. Like he's got so many skills defensively, but he makes just some just mental mistakes in the field where you're just kind of like, what was that after, you know, an inning before he's flashing the leather and making some play you didn't think was possible. Right. So, you know, they see the potential. They just need him to settle in and just kind of more establish himself defensively. You know, they're, they're trying to have him focus more on shortstop. 
uh, this year in, in camp. So that's clearly a position they want to see him uh, make the jump to the major leagues in. Uh, but they're they're going to roll with Alcides Escobar uh, as that starting shortstop and Cesar Hernandez as the starting second baseman. And then if there's an injury to either of the two of them, uh, unless they really like Hiri Adanza, uh, it's probably going to be Garcia coming up next. Could you imagine a starting infield where the entire <laughs> Left to right, it's Michael Franco, Alcides Escobar, and then I mean Cesar Hernandez. Like, uh, that's probably what we're looking at right now. It's just, I mean, I just the problem I have with that is like, if you're like, I would understand a fan being like, "What the hell is this?" Now, the keep him injury, sure, well, whatever. But like, I would understand if a fan is like, "I want Luis Garcia." I get your sentiment. I think 2020 mm-hmm. for him might have been a curse in some ways, right? Because it's like, look, we saw him hit a. At Nominal, you know, at a, yeah, yeah at, a, at a fine clip, right? Uh, you know, he's fine, you know, and I think that maybe adjusted some people's expectations for him. Do you agree with that? And so now it's kind of a weird situation. I mean, situation. there really weren't, there weren't many expectations right. for him. It was honestly. like, here comes I mean, a 19 year old. <laughs> yeah, you know, he was a kid who's maybe like fringe top 10 in the organization, but nobody that anyone was super excited about at that point maybe was looking at farther down the line. So, you know, but that, my thing, like, yes. Like they've got some veterans in there that when you're supposed to be a rebuilding team, why are they, uh, you know, as old as they are? But that's just it goes to show how bad the Nationals farm system was. Yeah. Prior to the trade deadline, I mean, I saw that uh, of the 12 players that they acquired at the deadline last year, 10 of them are either among the Nationals' top 30 prospects on MLB Pipeline or in the majors. I mean, that yeah. just shows you right then they needed right. almost all of those guys. I mean, it's crazy. And and even so, Baseball America only ranks them as the 24th farm system in baseball after all those moves. So, you know, they still have a ways to go. I guarantee you they're so, going to they're gonna end up needing all those guys, too. Like, the ones they didn't mm-hmm. need, they're going to eventually need them pretty soon. You, know, you don't crazy. get through a season with 26 guys. I mean, you're going to need to right. dig deep in your organization. And we haven't even started talking about the outfield. Uh, you know, Donovan Casey is a guy who I think is going to come up at some point this year and, and get some playing Believe time. Us. But in order for that to happen... You know, Lane Tom, you got to go through Lane Thomas, Victor Robles, and Yadiel Hernandez first, and maybe even Andrew Stevenson, uh, who are all guys who are technically above him. So, uh, you know, it's it, it's gonna it's gonna take some time. And I wrote in a column today uh, that I put out. I think I used five times. Patience, patience, patience. You, you got to have it in this situation because the Nationals are taking a longer road back to contention than simply just buying up players in free agency, which is what they have been doing uh, up until this point. So th- this is what this is what a rebuild slash retool looks like. But I'll t- I'll tell you this: like this feels so much different than other rebuilds you might see, because number one, they've got Juan Soto, right? Who might just be this is a rebuild where the be- arguably the best hitter, in my opinion, best hitter in baseball, is on. I mean, the if team. you are going to re if you are going to build an organization from scratch you, right you, now, you, who else you have the best Juan Soto. Play. I mean, right. literally. Yeah, because you have Tatis deep and Katrina ownership. have injury issues, and Vladdy Vladdy plays first. I mean, you know, I guess right field isn't that much more of a desirable defensive position, but it might be Vladdy and Soto are like the two right now. If you were to pick, I mean, you have an improving, player. improving guy in his young twenties who was a part. Of, it was an integral part of a World Championship winning team who just keeps getting better. Who put up some of the dumbest numbers that we've ever seen, and then you bring in a guy like Nelson. Like, like here's the thing: you last year, you and I mentioned it. The the fact that the front three of their lineup was like all it took was Kyle Schwarber and Trey Turner is really good, but because they had Turner and Soto, it was like yeah, I mean th- this thing works. I guarantee you, Bell, Cruz, and and Soto is going to work. It's going to, and that's what makes this this rebuild you know so exciting. Is that number one, the competition they're going to get to play is really good. They're going to be in a great division, so it's not like we're going to be seeing a bunch of you know crap come to DC, right? Number two, they've got a lot of interesting young guys that we want to see if they can break through or not. Number three, it's like their offense is probably going to be good. Matt, you and I have mentioned this a ton. The problem at the end of the year last year was not the offense. It's the bullpen nope. that lost them 42, 42 games, I think it was last yeah. year, and a starting rotation that had Josh Rogers and pa- – no no disrespect to Will Paul Espino, but those two guys in the end of it. Like, look, folks, it's a rebuild. Yes, retool, whatever you want to call it. It's going to be a fun one, though. Like, do, do not turn away. It's it's going to be at least entertaining. Yeah, no, I mean, look, 
Mike Rizzo thinks this team has a chance. You know, I'm not saying he he thinks they're going to be world beaters or right. world series favorites or anything like that, but he's coming in this year saying like, you know, we are trying to win ball games. We aren't out here trying to lose a hundred games. You know, that's in, like you said, this is not one of those rebuilds. This is, uh, you know, that's why I use the, the phrase retool a lot because they're trying to do this quickly. They're trying to do it before Juan Soto is able to leave for before free agency uh, and show him that they can build a competitive team again. I mean, if you think about it, Mike Rizzo has done this before. He took over the organization in 2009 as GM, and they won 98 games in 2012, three years. So if he can beat that timeline again, I mean, one, it'll just go to show how an amazing GM he is and how yeah. lucky the Nationals have been to have him. But two, uh, you know, that that is going to bode really well for their ability to keep Soto. And, and you know, it, it's... I think it's the right approach. I, I was saying it at the start of the 2021 season that trading Trey Turner was going to be a necessary evil. Uh, and it's exactly what they did. And hey, who knows, man, he's going to be a free agent next offseason. Maybe maybe the Freddie Freeman signing uh, was an indicator that the Dodgers weren't bullish on their chances of extending Trey. Who knows? Mm. Yeah, it's 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 so fascinating. I, I'm like, I'm really, I'm really pumped to see how this thing goes. And also the other part we haven't mentioned is a lot of these guys look at their contracts, their trade assets. Like it, it, you know, coming from the NBA mindset, you know, thinking about just like a, like think about a basketball, like all these guys, you know, expiring contracts, fire contracts. The Nationals are are built exclusively on expiring contracts, save like three players, right? They have a bunch got, of guys. I've got a list right here if you want me to run through it. Do it. Just just go through all these people because it's it's absolutely absurd. Players whose contracts will be up after this year is Nelson Cruz, Cesar Hernandez, Eric Fetty, Steve Ciszek. Harry Andrianza, Sean Doolittle, Alcides Escobar, uh, and man, who's he? Oh, Joe Ross. All of them are going to be free agents. And Josh Bell, I forgot Josh. Bell. I know it's the same. Thing. Josh Bell's players. the guy's going to come off that too. And and here's yeah. the thing, Matt: if they're not very good, all they need is like a few of those guys to be good. They don't need all of them to hit. You know, if a few of the, like like last year, think about the trade. You know, the the, the Brad Hand trade, right, or the Lane Thomas trade. Like those were not players that were really good. All it takes is a team that desperately needs something that is semi in contention to do something like, Hey, we just need a fifth guy. We'll trade for Eric Fetty, right? Man, we'll, we, you know, I, I mentioned about like extending Josh Bell, but if somebody's like, Oh my God, we need to have Josh Bell, we'll give up way too much for him. Take him up on it. C check, do little, uh, all, you know, like I know the, the pen, you want to keep building it, but if those older guys aren't helping you out that much, you're not winning ball you games. Know, like you can sign other guys next off season, the one year. Deal. I want to add mean, one more thing I want to ask you about uh, just real quickly on, on, on Josh Bell and uh, on um, Nelson Cruz and get you out of here. So the excitement for, um, especially Juan Soto of getting Nelson Cruz in there was big. Do you think it would be damaging at all if they flipped him in a trade? I know it's a one-year deal, the mutual option, but do you think that that wouldn't upset upset them at all, uh, Juan Soto at all? No, and I, I can't remember where I heard this, but uh, on I don't think it'd be upsetting Nelson to Juan Soto, uh, mostly because he's on a one-year deal anyway, and it's you right. know what are you going to be mad he doesn't get to spend the last month and a half of the season with him? No, I mean he'll learn from him. He'll get to hang out with him. For the first three months, and which, by the way, is an awesome pairing. I, I could not love that more. I'm uh, pumped for, for Soto's <laughs> career, uh, for his yeah. protection for his season in 2022. It's just, but uh, you know, for Cruz, you know, I think that a big reason why he signed with the Nationals one was to hit with Soto, but two, you know, yes, he he could have picked a team like I know the Padres were interested in him. Um, you know, I think the Rays wanted to bring him back. A couple other clubs. You know, he could have picked the team right now that was going for it and rolled the dice with them on getting back to the playoffs. But with the Nationals, you can play the first three months with them and then get traded to a contending team that you know is right in the thick of the playoff race. And you don't have to, you know, roll the dice six months in advance. You know that you probably have a good shot of playing in the playoffs. And where Cruz is in his career, you know, he obviously wants a ring. That would be, you know, an interesting, uh, you know, something for him where he kind of gets a little bit more security, even though he's actually going to a team that has less of a chance of making the playoffs. Um, I'm sure that, you know, he'll be able to uh, have some say in that conversation of where he gets traded. So we'll see, you know, it's certainly, yeah. um, you know, I, I think also just his impact in the lineup is going to trickle down on a lot of guys in, in more ways than one. And it's, it, it was just a great sign. I, I'm definitely a big fan of it. I thought it was a home run. I thought it was like a perfect fit for the nationals. Uh, Matt, 
Thank you so much for your time as always, man. What do you got coming up? What, what's out right now? Where do people need to find you and your work so they can get involved? Also, you're doing some Twitter spaces too. So tell us about those. Yeah, yeah. Hopped on a Twitter space earlier today. If you missed it, the recording uh, is on my Twitter account. Check it out at by Matt Wyrick. Uh, doing a bunch of stuff, uh, getting ready for the season over at NBCSportsWashington.com. Had a piece go up earlier today that I alluded to uh, on the Nationals' lack of spending in recent seasons and when they might uh, swing big on their next free agent. So definitely check that out. Uh, writing on arbitration stuff for tomorrow. So that'll be coming up in the morning. Um, but yeah, go ahead and check all that out and give me a follow. Matt Wyrick, NBC Sports Washington. Appreciate your time as always, man. Appreciate it, Josh.